good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Chaos TV West. Um, we are uh, going to see a um, pre-recorded talk by Michael Sperber uh, about mathematics for hackers. Uh, Michael is an, uh, um, once was a math mathematics student, but never finished his degree and is in the process of revisiting this old love of his. Um, this report is also simultan übersetzt in Deutsch. Um, and well, enjoy. Welcome. Well, I'm here to get you all excited about math for hackers. Now, uh, you can have an entire hacker's life without having encountered much of mathematics. After all, this conference and this community, to a large degree, really is about finding unexpected behavior in software, such as Heartbleed. I mean, there's zillions of examples, but Heartbleed is an example where, uh, you know, the OpenSSL API exposed secret memory through a regular API call. That was certainly um, unexpected. Now, uh, you might consider this unexpected behavior to be just an inevitable part of software development because it's so complex, right? Things that you didn't expect happen due to all the complications and the complexity. On the other hand, with critical infrastructure, such as OpenSSL, you really want certain aspects of that to really run reliably uh, correctly. And so really, that unexpected behavior comes down to a correctness issue. And of course, uh, that's where mathematics might come in, because mathematics deals in correctness a lot of the time uh, in the form of proofs. Now, uh, you can certainly apply proofs to software systems um, to, to great benefit, uh, but of course, proofs are often tedious and a lot of work. Um, they involve a great deal of mathematical intuition. Uh, you might not feel like that today, and you don't have to, because I will talk about something else today. Um, I will instead talk about mathematics as a language, right? This is not a new idea, this, it's hundreds of years old. Um, uh, here's a quote from Galileo that said, well, the world really um, can only be understood in terms of the language of mathematics. And uh, you know, a lot of mathematics concerns itself with finding formal methods for the world around us. Now, I wanna emphasize the fact that really mathematics doesn't, doesn't really model the world around us directly. It really does that through the detour through our perception, right? Mathematics really is, is, is a fundamentally human construct um, that our mind uses to understand the world around us. And in that way, it's also a social construct because, well, we don't really need mathematics if not for communication um, between different people. So, um, so, and that's really where, uh, you know, the value of mathematics for software comes in because software also is an image sort of all perceptions of the world around us a lot of the time, at least useful software is. So, one particularly useful part of mathematics for hackers, for software construction, is, uh, well, it's first of all, the language of equations. And uh, here's a couple of equations, right? X plus two equals six, so it's very simple, specifies a value for X. This next equation, well, it has, so X is a variable, and the next equation has two variables. It has X and Y, so it has, says two X squared plus two Y minus two equals zero. That's a quadratic equation. It might even have you know, several solutions. Um, and finally, there's an equation that involves a function uh, whose definition is unknown. It just says, well, f of five plus f of seven equals 70. Now, you know, when it comes to functions, well, those are things that also exist in software. So we might conceivably use the language of equations uh, involving functions to describe functions in our software. So we might take that equation to describe that piece of software written over on the right-hand side. And, well, you know, we could try to kind of work through it, right? Uh, you can see there's a function, there's a, there's a variable that's external to that function, so it goes across several invocations of it, um, call it y, and it's initialized as seven. And maybe if we call, you know, f of five, x is going to be five, you know, to kind of try to go through it in your mind. Z is going to stash the old vault value of y, which is seven, and then y is going to be set to x, so it's not going to be five, and then we multiply x with the old value of y, so we multiply 5 with 7, getting 35. So f of 5 might return 35. And uh, with f of 7, well, if we then after that call f of 7, y is now 5, we stash the old value in, uh, in z, so it's now 5, x is 7, and it returns 35 again, only the, you know, the product, the multiplication works in the other order. And the sum of that is 70. So you might say, well, that equation describes that function. Um, over there. 
But really, we had to go through a lot of detail and sort of tracing through the program to figure that out. And also, it only works with that initial value of y, and it only works if we call those functions from left to right. But the language of equation doesn't say anything like that, that we really need to respect order or something like that. Really, f of 5 in mathematics should always return the same value. Otherwise, you know, it becomes much harder to really consistently apply the language of equations to programs. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, really, so that's, that's, I guess, the first hint that mathematics gives you is that you should write functions that always return the same value given the same input. But, um, you know, I digress. Um, another aspect of uh, the language of equations is a concept called substitution that you probably know. So imagine that first equation says, well, x equals to 7, and then there's a formula that has that variable occurring in it. And in the context of that first equation, what we can do is we can kind of plug into that and plug in that equation. We can substitute every occurrence of x with, uh, um, with the number 7 in this case, and then use that to uh, figure out the final result of that formula. That's also something that fundamentally only works um, you know, if, uh, if x doesn't change over time, um, if your functions really return the same value every time you call them with the same um, input. Now, the substitution principle is not just for uh, equations of the form where you say x has, is a certain number. Uh, you might also have an equ equation that expresses x in terms of another variable, such as the z in this case. And, you know, that first equation means, well, I can plug in 2z every time x occurs um, in that formula and then use that to do further evaluation or simplification of that formula. And what's more, it also works the other way around, right? I can work, I can sort of read that equation uh, um, in the second line also from right um, to left, so order does not matter. So that's a fundamental principle of a branch of mathematics called algebra, right? That we have uh, variables and that we have that substitution principle and that we have equations. So, well, here's a well-known algebraic formula, the, the binomial formula, formula, or one of them at least. Um, um, and you know, you might have, you might have learned that in high school. But today, I want to look at a couple of more slightly more fundamental equations, and um, that might be part might have been part of your school algebra class. So, um, you know, I want to point out that all of these equations have names, and you might try to think of them right now. But I'll try to go through them. You might think of the names and then I'll resolve uh, when I'm done. So the first equation says when you multiply three numbers, it doesn't matter which whether you will first multiply the first and the second one and then the result with the third one, or uh, whether you first multiply the second and the third one and then multiply with the first. Uh, I'm going from right to left here. The second equation says you can swap the two arguments of a multiplication, and the third one says that you can kind of multiply out a sum. Right? in the sense that, um, you know, uh, w when you have a times the sum of b and c, you know, you can multiply a individually which, with each of the, um, of the sums there. Now, here are the names, right? The first one says, well, you know, the, it doesn't matter which way we associate, um, you know, the, 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 the multiplication uh, with these three numbers, so it's called associativity. The second one, well, it comes from a verb that says to, uh, to swap. Uh, so it's called commutativity, and the third one is really about distributing a multiplication uh, over an addition, so it's called distributivity. Um, and so, I mean, these are all very valuable and useful equations, but really the most useful one is the first one, associativity. And associativity is something that works not just for plus, it also works for multiplication, for example. So really when you talk about associativity, you don't talk about it in, in isolation. You have to say what operation you mean is associative or is not associative. In this case, plus or times. Moreover, uh, associativity is something that's not restricted to numbers. So, for example, here are two Boolean equations that specify associativity for a Boolean or or and. So, with the or operation, you can take two Boolean values, uh, three Boolean values. Doesn't matter which way you or them up. Uh, you always get the same result, and the same works for the Boolean AND operation. And, well, these are kind of primitive values, but you can also have values that have structure. So, for example, you might program with 
uh, a list data structure. So you have a list with elements A1, A2, and so on until AN. And you might take two lists where the second one has elements B1, B2, da 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 da, BN, and you concatenate them together. I wrote this with you know that funny you know bow tie symbol there, concatenation. Uh, so you so you concatenate the, those two lists, and that operation that concatenates any two lists is, if you think about it, also associative. Now, what value does it have to know that an operation is associative? Um, so here's here's a classic example where that's valuable. Uh, one way to think about associativity is well, you know, you can move the parentheses around, right? Um, and if you can move the parentheses around, it doesn't matter where they are, and if you just um, um, and that meant that, and that means that uh, you can leave them out entirely if you have sort of a chain of the same kind of operation. So imagine you have a large parallel computation that's structured in the following way. You have individual computations, A, B, C, D, and so on until Z. And they're all independent of one another. And to get the result of your overall computation, you all combine them with that operation that's written as that black rhomboid um, I'm just going to say diamond from now, so the diamond operation. And um, so, so the combination works with the diamond operation, but if you know that the diamond operation is associative, it means you can sort of bunch up your ABCs any way that you like. Um, and so, for example, you might say, well, if I've got you know four machines working on this parallel computation, I can split my individual computations into four bunches, combine, you know, diamond, you know, the first bunch, the second bunch, the third bunch, and the fourth bunch, and then combine the results of those, and I get the same results. No, it doesn't really matter if it's five bunches or six or seven, or even if it's irregular, right? And so that's the freedom that associativity gives you in distributing um, um, your computation. And, you know, this was what I just told you is, an, is a classic big data abstraction for large-scale parallel computations called MapReduce. Um, but I really want to talk about something more fundamental um, today, which is um, you know, how we think about the things that happen in our software. So here is an excerpt from the Java API documentation, and it draws an oval. It sort of has to do with graphics, with images. And you, know, you, you notice, right, the draw oval operation, it has return type void, and the documentation there talks uh, about it in terms of pixels. Now, um, Really, I mean, we think of an oval as a thing, right? As an object or a shape or something like that, right? As an entity in its own right. But if you look at the documentation there, you can see that draw oval doesn't create an object that corresponds to the notion our mind has of an oval, right? It just flips the colors of a bunch of pixels in some, you know, imagined uh, canvas that draw oval paints on. So that's very different, right? And then the notion of having an, a thing that's an oval is really something that our mind reconstructs from those pixels. Um, but that gives us a very limited uh, sort of API for dealing with images. And you can do that differently um, in a way that then is amenable to algebra and mathematics. And um, well, you can find that several places. One that's particularly accessible is uh, the Racket Image Teach Pack library that comes with the Racket system. So I put a download link down there, generally a great system to play with. And um, so this is how it works. Well, Racket is a Lisp-like language, so the syntax works a bit different from uh, Java or C in that when you call a function, the parentheses go you know, around the function call and the arguments, and the arguments are separated by white space rather than commas. So first thing is you call a function called circle, you pass it three arguments, 50, solid, and red, and it returns a red circle, well, as you might imagine. But really, I want you to understand that it doesn't you know, flip pixels or something like that. It really returns an object representing the circle, and it's only the, um, um, and it's only the Dr. Racket API that then um, displays that object as an actual picture that we can view. But it could also you know, do something else with that picture, you know, save it to a file, um, you know, send it to somebody over the network or something like that. Um, so, well, first function returns a circle. Second function, there's also a square function that uh, returns a square. You can see I can put something, I can put outline instead of solid to say that I want uh, just the outline of a square or there's this blue star at the bottom returned by the star function. So these three functions are kind of primitive in the way that they create images out of thin air from a bunch of numbers um, and strings. And 
Here's another such function called right triangle that creates a triangle out of thin air. Now, there's three more operations here that don't create something out of thin air. So there's the rotate function, for example. It takes an image. An existing image has to exist before you call rotate and rotates it, in this case by 10 degrees, just a little bit. And uh, then there's two other functions, flip vertical, which flips an image vertically, and flip horizontal, which flips it horizontally. So it creates a mirror image, if you will. Now, um, you know, these two functions, you know, they transform an image in some way. And what's important to understand is an image object goes in and they return an image object also. And that image object that's returned, you can pass it to other operations. So, for example, um, that's what happens here. You can, uh, for example, you can rotate that uh, triangle, again, as we did on the slide before, and you can pass that result. You can stick it into flip vertical to then flip the rotated image. Now, what you see here is particular examples. So what happens to the triangle when you first rotate and then flip, but um, you know, some, of, some of these things can be generalized to general equations that hold for all images. So here's two very simple examples. The first one says, well, if I flip an image and I flip it again, I get the same image out again. Right? And that, I think, hopefully plays to your um, visual imagination or intuition. The second equation says, well, if you flip horizontally and then vertically, or you do it the other way around, you first flip vertically and then horizontally, you get the same result. And again, that should conform to your um, visual intuition. So those are two general equations that characterize how images work and how image construction works. And, um, you know, we can uh, uh, get some particularly useful equations from uh, uh, these three uh, um, operations that are on this slide here. Now, what they do is they don't just take one image and output one image the way that rotate and the flips do, um, but they take two images each and return one image that results from combining them. So the first function, the side, takes two images and sticks them together horizontally, gives you the resulting image. Above, puts them above each other, gives you the result. And overlay puts them on top of each other. Uh, and these are operations, you know, they have the same form as plus or list concatenation or multiplication or 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 and in the sense that, you know, or takes two booleans, returns a boolean. Plus takes two numbers, returns a number. Beside takes two images, returns an image. Same thing for above and overlay. And whenever you have that, you have a function that takes two things, returns one thing. You can think about associativity, and you should. And in fact, you know, these functions, if you kind of work, again, through your visual intuition, uh, you can figure out that beside, above, and overlay are all associative operations. So with overlay, for example, it should be especially intuitive in that if you have three images on top of each other, it should not matter whether you first kind of staple the top ones together and then the bottom one to the bottom, or whether you first staple together the bottom two and then put the top one on top. In each case, you have, you know, layers um, in the same sequence. Now, what can you do with, you know, again, what can you do knowing that um, you have an associative operation? Uh, we already talked about parallelization. Generally, you can do optimizations based on the, for example, uh, some of the other equations. For example, the equation that says, you know, flip horizontally twice doesn't do anything. You can use that to optimize, right? When you see somebody doing a flip twice, you just throw out those operations. You don't have to compute um, the actual flip. You can also imagine computations where you can cache intermediate results in the same way that um, you know you kind of process that parallel computation in a tree shape, um, and it gives you great flexibility in that caching and recombining the cache values. Um, so you can get it generally get it just use that for performance. You could also turn those equations into what's called property-based testing, right? You could uh, stick in random values for the variables. Uh, and test whether the equations are actually fulfilled, and that might help you debug uh, or ensure the correctness of your library. And finally, if you really need something to be correct, then uh, you could provide formal proofs giving you added assurance uh, using a technique called induction, because you combine two things into a thing and you kind of have to walk uh, you know, that construction um, backwards. But again, this talk is not really concerned with proofs that much. But again, I really, I mentioned that earlier, I really want to talk about the modeling aspect um, that, um, you know, this mathematical way of thinking about it suggests, right? Again, remember sort of the Java draw oval function that just flips the um, color of a bunch of pixels. 
And, you know, here's the picture, but really we view this picture, our, our mind views this picture as, um, <clears throat> you know, a bunch of concentric circles, and each circle is a thing in its own right. Now, um, you know, I, I don't know what's intuitive to you, but apparently, you know, it was intuitive to some people to create that first function, draw oval. And um, um, <clears throat> that mathematical intuition really tells you, really make pictures, make images into objects, and then create abstractions based upon them. So, um, I mean, we can use mathematics to kind of, you know, create, create equations after the fact, but really mathematics gives us great suggestions as what the library, what the API should look like in the first place that, um, well, I often see people doing something else so that intuition might have something to do with that mathematical understanding. So let me talk a little bit more about that language of mathematics uh, now that we've figured out uh, the importance of associativity or equations in general. So, you know, people working in algebra, they always talk about structures that have three parts and uh, or have three pieces, right? One piece is a mathematical set, so just a collection of a bunch of things, of objects. Um, then they have operations on those sets, and then they have equations in, uh, involving those operations. So on the right-hand side, you could see what we know already. So you have some set M, could be anything, could be booleans, could be numbers, could be images. And then you have an operation, diamond, that combines two of those Ms into one M. Well, here's a little bit funny in notation, right? With a cross there, uh, what it says is there's two inputs, right? Cross, cross, cross for each input. Uh, so, so the diamond operation has one M as an input, another M as an input, and then there's the arrow, and that says that there's also an M as the output. And then, finally, there's that associativity equation uh, that we've already seen quite a few times today. And those three things package up together, the set and the operation on that set, in this case, just a single operation, and the equations, uh, in this case, associativity, this is all called a semi-group, right? And there are other algebraic structures that, uh, that we'll see. Now, this translates directly to programming. You know, your set M in mathematics might just be a type in your program. And these semi-groups, they occur in lots of places. So with all of those things that we've already seen with associativity, you could just kind of shorten your language and say all of those things are semi-groups. So, for example, at the top, it says, well, if you take the mathematical set of real numbers, that's what, that funny R, that hollow R that you see, the real numbers, um, and, you know, with the plus operation, it takes two numbers from the R set and produces one number. Of course, has associativity, therefore it's a semigroup. Lists with concatenation fulfill the associativity equation, therefore they form a semigroup. And, for example, the overlay operation from the images, just as, as beside and above do, has that same shape, right? Combines two images into one image and fulfills associativity. Therefore, images and overlay form a semigroup. Now, a semigroup is not the only algebraic structure, um, you know, but it's a, it's a fairly humble one. It doesn't, it can't do a whole lot, and therefore, kind of, mathematicians build up from them. They say, take a simple algebraic structure and they add more operations or something else to it. So, for example, the next step up from a semigroup is something called a monoid. So, you take a semigroup and you add something, and uh, well, I'll try to explain what that is. So, again, you have a set, you have a binary operation, that diamond operation, and you also say that in that set M, there has to be a special element, right? And you have to know what it is. Um, and that element is called bottom. That's what that line says, you know, that, that the upside down T, that's what I call it, bottom. Um, and it ha also has to be part of that set M. And now, as usual, because every monoid is a semigroup, the associativity equation holds. And the bottom line explains about the identity element, about the bottom element, where it says, well, if you use the diamond operator to combine A with the identity, or identity with A, you get back A. Um, in Germany, you often use the word neutral element, so it's really, it's, it's neutral with, um, um, with respect to the binary operation that you have in your semigroup, and hopefully that appeals to your intuition as it does to mine. Um, and, you know, if you take an algebra class at the university level, you might learn about more involved algebraic structures such as groups and rings and fields. And every time you go a step up, right, a, a monoid is a semigroup plus the neutral element. A group is a monoid with even more 
you know, more operations and more equations. A ring even involves a second, uh, you know, a ring involves another operation and more laws. Same thing for a field. So, you know, you just add a bunch of stuff as you go up the ladder. But for hacking, really, for computing, for writing software, the two most important ones from that, uh, from that stack here are semigroup and monoid. You don't really have to worry about the rest uh, unless you really write uh, you know, mathematically inclined software that involves um, those algebraic instructions. So we've seen a bunch of semigroups. Have we seen a bunch of monoids? Yeah, well, essentially all the semigroups that we've already seen are also monoids. So for example, the plus operation on the numbers, right? Zero is the identity there. You add zero to a number, you get back that same number. With multiplication, well, you multiply a number by one, you get back that same number. You have a list. You concatenate it with it, the empty list. Doesn't matter whether it's left or right. Well, sure enough, you get the same list. Uh, now, the <laughs> bottom three examples might like a little, look a little bit funny because they suggest that there is an identity um, for those, those operations, but they all are the empty image, so they're invisible. Um, and so that points that out to you. And monoids, I can't really overemphasize this. Monoids are everywhere around us, right? So, well, now, software engineer asked me a, uh, a while ago and said, well, you know, your, your mathematical structure is all good and well, but, you know, uh, you know, what about really concrete, um, you know, software things? So, you know, we do shopping carts. How could you possibly use mathematical structure for a shopping cart? But, of course, well, a shopping cart, uh, you know, you might have a shopping cart associated with your account at some shop, right? And, but on another day, you might go shopping and forget to log into your account. But you can usually still, you know, fill a shopping cart. Um, now, once you check out that shopping cart to buy the stuff in it, um, it will usually ask you to log in. Now, there's two shopping carts, one inside your account and the one that you just filled. They have to be combined into one. Um, and really, it's worthwhile to think about what properties that combination operation um, should have. But there's other, many other examples from monoids. I have some concrete examples from applications that I've worked on. Uh, a famous paper in, in functional programming, for example, is about financial contracts. Sure enough, they form a monoid. Uh, recently, I talked to a company that makes a configurable flower bouquet. So you might have, well, you might combine two flowers, two sets of flowers into one to form a bouquet. Um, you know, all kinds of things. Monoids really are everywhere around us. Um, you know, so much that, uh, you know, my friend Carl Elliott has elevated this to a general design principle. Whenever you write software for a particular domain, you should look for mathematical algebraic structure. And because monoids are so common, you know, one thing that you can always try is look for binary operation on your objects, look for, check if the associative law holds, look for an identity. And, um, you know, if, if you find, if you don't find that op binary operation, okay, but if it's not associative, you know, that's maybe a sign that you should try to make it associative. It doesn't always work, but frequently does. And um, and usually gives you some improvement in the process. Same thing for identity. If there isn't one, you might make one up, uh, trusting that you might need it later. Uh, Connell calls this a tau check. Something that I really like is whether the software model that you're creating aligns with uh, mathematics. And that means, uh, you know, the deeper structure of the universe that humanity has discovered in the hundreds of years uh, that were there before computing. Monoids are also useful in differentiation from things that are not monoids. So, for example, the maximum operation that gives you the bigger of two numbers does not form monoid. It gives you a semigroup. It's associative. But, uh, well, there's no, there's no identity, right? You know, thinking about it, you might think, well, but uh, isn't it, can't I take like minus infinity or something like that? But of course, that's not a real number, but it maybe gives you a hint as to how you could complete that structure if you really need a monoid. And I'll get back to that in a second. But first, I want to talk about a general principle in that, um, I mean, you can't just, it's not just discovering sort of monoids in the domain objects around you. You can also construct uh, monoids systematically. Um, specifically, you can create larger monoids out of smaller ones. So this is probably the most complicated slide that I have, so don't worry, it'll be over in a second. But we'll try to go through it line by line. So imagine you have two monoids. And the first one is called M1, the second one is called M2, and each has their own diamond combination operation. The first one is called diamond one, the second one is called diamond two. First one takes two M1s, gives you back an M1, the second one gives, takes two M2s, gives you back an M2. 
Now, using those two monoids, you can create a larger monoid by taking pairs of elements from M1 and M2. That's what that funny cross means. It means it's something called the Cartesian product. So it forms, out of two sets, it forms the set of pairs where there's one from each of those two sets in there. And in order to make that a monoid, we have to define a binary operation. I'm just going to call it diamond. And you can see the diamond is defined in such a way that one pair out of M1 and M2 goes in, another pair out of M1 and M2 goes in, and it returns another pair out of M1 and M2. And the way it's defined is you take two pairs and you combine the first elements from both pairs using the M1 monad and the diamond one operation. And you combine the second elements of both pairs using the diamond operation from the M2 uh, monoid. And sure enough, you know, that gives you an operation that's associative. I didn't put that on the slide, but it also gives you an identity out of with a pair that consists of the individual identities from M1 and in M2. You know, that works. Um, also, you know, sometimes you have a semigroup lying around, but you really need a monoid. Um, I mean, a semigroup, that's not a monoid, but you really need a monoid. Here's a little construction that will build a monoid from a semigroup. So again, we start with a set. We start with a binary operation on that set called diamond. And then we create another set that I call M bottom. Again, that funny upside down T that you see there. And we create it by adding artificially one new element to it, right? It can't be in there before. And then we define a new operation, you know, diamond bottom, uh, that operates on that set. And, um, and we just define it in such a way that if either side of that operation is the identity, the bottom element, we just uh, have it return the other side. So, you know, bottom, diamond bottom, bottom returns you A, and the same thing the other way around. And whenever, you know, um, that operation is called on two things that are not bottom, we just call the original operation. And sure enough, that gives you a monoid, even if the thing before, the M before, was just a semigroup. And you might have seen that construction when programming. Um, so for example, the Java library has something called an optional. And that is exactly that. And um, again, when you're defining abstractions like that, the mathematical notion and the mathematical equations can provide a guide as to how that API should behave um, if it's supposed to be reasonable. If you still bear with me and have a little bit of patience left, um, here's another concept, uh, it's a little bit more abstract, uh, called the homomorphism that's useful in thinking about APIs, um, at least APIs that combine in this way uh, via something like a monoid. So look at the first equation. It says, well, if you take an overlay of two images A and B, maybe more like this, right, and you rotate it, that is the same as taking one image, rotating it, taking another image, rotating it, and slapping them uh, together after the fact. And this is what's called, so what, what that means is really rotate here is what's called a homomorphism. It can kind of slip inside um, the overlay operation. Uh, or another way to talk about it is commutes or can trade places with the uh, overlay operation. And that uh, on the left-hand side of the equation, the rotate is outside and the overlay is inside. And on the other side of the equation, it's exactly the other way around. With the next equation there, flip vertical of the side, right? And then the idea is, well, you flip one, you flip one, and then do the side. Um, you know, that seems, that's certainly eminently re reasonable, but if you think about it, it might depend on the alignment that you choose for your images as you put them side to side, right? You might decide to align them by the top half like this, and then, well, you might come to the conclusion that that equation does not hold. So, but again, it provides a guide. It probably should hold, you should design the beside operation in such a way that it works. Now the operation, the equation at the bottom really does not work, right? Uh, oops, there it is. Um, but you know, if you have five minutes after this talk, um, uh, or even now, you might think about an, an equation that's very similar to that one that does hold and that gives you some insight. So that's also a useful notion when you're designing APIs. Here's another useful notion in that, well, with images, uh, really, I mean, there's the visual aspect, right, that we perceive images by looking at a certain pair of coordinates and perceiving a certain color. And, uh, you know, that color might be, we might represent it by a value, and that value might come from different types. Uh, and that gives you different notions of images. So, for example, an image of bulls, well, so each, each 
coordinate can only be on or off or black and white, so it gives you a black and white picture. Uh, the next one, where there's just a number there, it might give you some, some notion of grayscale. Um, and, um, uh, or you could, of course, then, as in the bottom two examples, you could stick RGB triples in there to give you arbitrary colors or even an alpha channel or something like that. So when you have a type such as image that has a parameter, very frequently you can add a little bit of structure, uh, what's called a map operation that you might have seen. Uh, not going to worry about the details there, but uh, you might get a structure called a functor. Um, and uh, the word functor comes from um, a particularly abstract branch of algebra um, called category theory, but even you know the mathematicians sometimes call that abstract nonsense. And uh, but you know, despite the term, um, it really is something that's very useful um, and very insightful into the structure. It gives you a lot of insight into the structure of things. And category theory frequently describes relationships between things through diagrams that are quite beautiful. So here is a characterization of uh, the idea of a monoid. You don't have to understand that diagram, but merely, mainly, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, after this and after you've mastered monoids for a while, you, you'll have a look at category theory and enjoy it. Um, you know, you get more complicated diagrams such as this one and more involved abstractions, um, uh, such as, well, we, I mentioned functor, there's also the uh, infamous monad, and these are things that are practical, uh, eminently practical for creating higher order and, and generally higher level abstractions. Again, you know, not, not, not for this talk, that's a different talk. But I hope I've instilled in you the sense that, uh, you know, mathematics, at least this kind of simple mathematics, is useful. If you felt that it hasn't been simple, that it's been hard, I want to point out that, well, it might be hard to understand everything uh, that's been on the slides on this talk, but it's not due to the fact that it's complicated, right? It's not, there's not a lot of moving parts or something like that. Um, but it is abstract, and the human mind, you know, needs some time and finds it difficult to deal with abstraction. And therefore, you might also, if you're interested in this stuff, you might give your mind some time to get adjusted to those mathematical concepts, and maybe look at it again in a couple weeks, uh, just have a brief look, uh, you know, uh, maybe look for uh, a monoid or just a binary operation, look for associativity, and by and by, that stuff will become more familiar uh, and commonplace to you and you'll find it easier to deal with it. And once that happens, I think you'll find that very satisfying. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to read up some more detail on this, um, I've, I've um, put in four references that are linked from the slides that you can hopefully download from somewhere. Uh, but you can also just kind of search for um, those titles and you'll find um, those papers. So first one is a paper by Brent Yorge that really takes that idea of using monoids to structure an image library to the limit uh, so that's, uh, that's just a great paper. Um, uh, then there's a book by Sandy McGuire on algebra-driven design. Who, you know, he applies that to different, that idea to different practical settings. Um, uh, Connell Elliott gave a great foundational type uh, talk on something called denotational design. So that's a video, also has a paper, but I really recommend you look at the video. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the classic paper that introduced this notion of dealing with images by combining them uh, is by Peter Henderson, something called functional geometry. And I hope you'll Enjoy looking at that stuff as much as I will. And I hope you enjoy the Congress. I hope to see you around. Uh, well, have a good time. Bye. So thank you for this uh, interesting uh, talk, Michael. And um, there are a few questions uh, from the internet already. And for those who haven't asked questions yet, if you use the hashtag uh, RC3CWTV on either Twitter, Mastodon, or the proper uh, IRC channel, uh, we can still include them in this uh, Q&A. And the first question I would like you to ask you, uh, Michael, is uh, maybe a strange one, but you mentioned this concept of um, homomorphisms uh, uh, of the monoids. And I was wondering, whether we could do the reverse around, could you, could you use these mathematics to visualize APIs? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so um, let me think about it for a moment. So with a monoid, um, 
so yeah, I, I, so the answer is first of all, is yes. Um, so with a monoid, one way to think about a monoid is not just, um, you know, this abstract thing that's going on, right? Um, but since, you know, any value in the monoid, you can kind of be built up by this operation that's sitting in the monoid. You could also just represent a monoid, not just by some, um, some abstraction, but you can build uh, what's called a free structure. Um, and, uh, and that has tree, that is tree structured and that you could visualize. So that's one half of the answer. And um, on the last slide, I had a reference, the very first reference uh, on a paper by Brent Yorge shows how, how that works. And it's generally a paper on visualization. Um, so that would be one half of the answer. The other half is that I remember one industrial project that I've worked on where people wanted, so there, there was kind of a, a complicated data flow problem. Um, and the requirement of the customer was, well, people want to assemble a configuration for a scheduling problem in semiconductor fabrication, if you will. And they said, well, we want, we just want a bunch of boxes and arrows. Um, and, you know, people should be able to arrange that visually to specify a configuration. And we ended up looking for the right uh, formalism to do that. In fact, there is one in category theory. I mean, category theory generally is diagrams. Um, um, but there is a concept in category theory which just happened to fit, and we found it by going from the customer requirement to the um, uh, by, by going from the customer requirement to the mathematics, and that gave us a naturally and very pleasant and actually mathematic, mathematically precise uh, visualization form for that. So I, I argue it's it's a great tool to think about visualization. Hope that helps a little bit. Okay, so we can finally look forward to this this kind of neuromancer like landscapes while uh, yeah. hacking. It feels like that sometimes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, another question was from a viewer who had never seen such sexy algebra in their life, uh, whether you're willing to submit a proposal next year to go to more in-depth continuation talk. Sure. <laughs> Very happy yeah, to. That's, that's a short <laughs> that's a short that's a short answer to a, okay, a, a relatively I'll, long I'll, can't say you haven't been warned, but um, yeah, I'll try. Yeah, yeah, and also it needs to be accepted the content thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, another question that is about something you said you wouldn't talk about, and that is about formal verification of algorithms. Yeah, um, but nonetheless, it might be useful for uh, the audience to know if there's an informal uh, verification of algorithms. Uh, what avenues you would suggest to people, especially people without much of a formal background in mathematics, to start looking at as it places for further learning for that uh, topic? Yes. Um, yeah, that's that's an excellent question. So I think one place that I'd start with, and I think there have been talks about this at earlier iterations of the Congress that I'm sure you can find. There is, um, in fact, there's a new, if you will, family of programming languages that are based on uh, strong types called dependent types, and they're very expressive, and they allow you to express mathematical properties. Now, in the old days, we would write down a mathematical property of a program that we wanted to have, and then we would uh, use, uh, if, if things are good, we would use a proof assistant to find the proof, and that would be a very um, uh, cumbersome you know, process that you would have to do. Now, with this new family of programming languages, Idris and Agda are two prominent examples. Um, what you can do is you can give a type um, and you can push a button, essentially. It's not quite so easy, but th there's actually IDE support where you can push a couple of buttons and it will generate a program that has that type. And that program is guaranteed to be correct, right? Because with the combination of the, of the type and the program itself, there is the proof right there sitting there. Um, and that, at least for simpler things, takes away a lot of the burden um, that at least at least the burden of getting into um, this kind of tool. It's still kind of intricate work to put together more complicated proofs, but to get into that medium is just great fun and it's very satisfying activity. And you're not you don't have that impression that you sometimes have with proof assistants that you're kind of fiddling in the dark with a screwdriver. So um, if it's a concrete place that you're looking for, I would I would recommend looking at a programming language called Idris and maybe look at some of the Congress talks that we've had about it in the past. Yeah, uh, having been to at least one of those Congress talks, I also would ask a follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. um, does the new typing capabilities that, for example, Rust provides, 
uh, rise to this level uh, that you mentioned with Idris and other languages, or is that not advanced enough for that yet? So, so I'm not an expert on Rust. Uh, I haven't seen IDE support on that level. Um, I'm pretty sure the type. I mean, I mean, Rust gives a, has a type system that has a specific kind of expressive capability that allows you to express memory safety, right? And then, because you know your type correct program, if you're not using the unsafe features, is guaranteed. It's kind of proven to be correct uh, to adhere to those um, uh, to those memory safety criteria. Um, but the general. I have not seen the general expressivity that uh, languages like Idris gives you um, in Rust. Uh, maybe there's a way to do it, um, uh, but I'm pretty well. I'm I'm reasonably confident it's not as practical and not as easy to get into. Yeah, and also it's way off topic since you said you wouldn't be talking about <laughs> this anyway in this in, in, <laughs> by now. So we're sort of hearing this. Um, That's fine. Um, uh, the other um, question, one of the other questions is: um, Will you be around in the in the two D world uh, sometime to talk directly to people from the audience? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we'll do that right after the talk. Uh, maybe with a little, yeah. maybe after a little and, lunch. And, and what, nick, uh, what 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 nickname will you be? Using? Where will you be hanging out? Uh, my Twitter handle, which was also the beginning, called Spurpson. Um, we have this 2D RC3 world, this, this kind of online adventure thing where, the, mm -hmm. where people visiting are walking around with their avatars. And, and mm -hmm. um, But you haven't been there yet, I take it. From your no, 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 I have been there. I'm just saying my avatar there has the same name as my Twitter handle. Which I'm, sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting so, you. So it's called, so it's called, it's called Spurpson. Okay. <laughs> Spurber was not available anymore. Uh, apologies so for I'll interrupting you. I'll idea. be there. Yes. Um, uh, and I think this, uh, oh, there's another question. And uh, there's something like a Turing machine have been constructed with the mathematics of 2000 years ago. So I got Turing machine and I got mathematics as of 2000 yeah. years ago, but I lost yeah, that something, could some, Okay, could something like a Turing machine be constructed with the mathematics of 2000 years ago? This may be a bit of a speculative question. Uh, I don't see anything that wasn't there. Um, I don't see why not. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not 100% sure what exactly the mathematics of 2,000 years ago was, right? Um, uh, you know, my, my basic knowledge goes back a couple of hundred years. Um, but uh, the basic mechanism of Turing machine is very simple. It's not my preferred mechanism to talk about mathematics and hacking, but um, sure, why not? Um, and the, the uh, I think the question is, uh, she says on teaching Haskell in teaching. Ah, well, that's a great question. It kind of goes, I'm doing a workshop later on teaching programming. I think teaching programming using Haskell is a terrible idea. Uh, so, um, um, obviously, you all know I'm, I'm a big fan of functional programming. I actually do a lot of um, Haskell in my daily life, and I've given talks using and on Haskell uh, in the past. But Haskell is a programming language coming out of a research community and used for professional programming. If you really want to do an effective introduction to programming, you're well off using specialized programming languages for learning. Um, that's what I'm going to advocate later today at 4 p.m. Middle European time. Okay, thank you all. And... Um uh, this concludes this session. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me.